It's always good to be in front of a lot of people in the vertical position. <laughs> I hope I stay that way. Okay, we're going to start off with this quick little journey, a 12-minute journey. Uh, I spent a lot of time contemplating about the last eight years or so working in Haiti and trying to introduce the culture of science, in this case aquaculture, helping the Haitian people raise fish to feed their families and themselves. Um, so that's the culture I come from and the culture of Haiti. This was, when I stare into the back of my eyelids and reflect back on those years, the metaphor that kept popping up over and over again was a dance. Now, follow me with this. Um, what is a dance? Um, a dance involves trust. It involves two people or a group of two groups of people uh, wanting the same outcome. Nobody wants to look foolish. Uh, it involves hopefully a common tune, but most of all it involves some trust. And the last eight years have been really remarkable for me in trying to introduce this science, the science of raising fish into a culture like Haiti, where the, 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 the reasons of cause and effect are so different. I mean, we have to look at this hallway right here. There's probably more Nobel laureates that have come through those doors next to the rooms in Stockholm. There's probably more Nobel laureates that have come through those doors than any other place in the world. This is the background where we've come from. All the science, the science we've heard today, the science that uh, we hear in all the bars and classrooms and labs all around this place. And this all started with the phone call. About eight years ago, the phone rang. Bill, this is your father. There's nothing wrong with East North Carolina. <laughs> he said, Bill, we've got a problem down in Haiti. I said, Dad, talk to me. He said, well, our church has been supporting this mission in Haiti, and they've been trying like the Dickens to raise fish, and they're having an awful time doing it, and we need your help. Now, this is my heart just lit up. I'm thinking, first of all, I'm saying, wow. My whole life has been involved with aquaculture, producing fish for production, poundage, helping uh, farmers in Mississippi, the Soviet Union, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, everywhere. My life has been surrounded with the sole goal of trying to produce fish. And uh, thank goodness I work with a great team of people here at the MBL who have the same type of passion. So this was great. This was low-hanging fruit. This was an opportunity where I could take this passion and this experience of, uh, that I have and my colleagues have and introduce it or work with some people who really can use it. Uh, interesting, Haiti, 63% of the people in Haiti survive on one meal or less a day. We've all heard the grim statistics about Haiti and I'm not going to go into it, but that's an awful lot. That's 63% of the people surviving on one meal or less a day. Now, okay, let's take a quick jump here. Let's take a, a, take a quick look at the dance floor. Now, there's Haiti right there. Half of it's Dominican Republic, the other half is Haiti, that small little island. That little speck right there, about the size of the state of Maryland, was once one of the wealthiest countries in the Western Hemisphere. This, by the way, is a picture of the Western Hemisphere. I don't need to tell anybody that. Um, Haiti was also in a very, very dangerous spot. Okay, you've got currents, we've got oceanographers in this room. You've got, Haiti was basically the breadbasket for, for all of France and a lot of Europe. Um, it was basically an ATM machine with no pin required. Anybody, any Tom, Dick, or Harry, country settlers, explorers, were coming into Haiti and basically exploiting it for all types of different things. That's what Haiti was. Okay, now let's take a quick look. I don't think a lot of people realize that. But let's take a now look, quick look at what Haiti is is now. Okay. This is a closer look at Haiti. This is where, here's Port-au-Prince, this is L'Aquille, this is the little town where we do most of our work out of. And our work is up in this area here, the mountains of Cormier area, where we're helping the people raise sloppy. Now these are, 70% of the population in Haiti lives in rural areas. And 70%, 70 to 73% of the population relies on agribusinesses to survive. Okay, oh, just incidentally, the epicenter of the earthquake was right about the top of that L. We won't have a lot of time to go into the earthquake. Maybe afterwards over in the Meg's room, if people have questions, we can go into that. But Okay, gives you an idea how close we were, where the earthquake was and where our area of working is. This is a very rugged area. Okay, so what is Haiti now? 
Okay, tough area. Tough area for people that rely on agribusinesses to survive. The land here is a lot like the moon. I can't really tell whether it's hard packed dirt or coral or what, but you can barely hammer a nail into the soil. Um, okay, here we go. We've all heard about the deforestation in Haiti, and I want to correct a little bit of um, some misinformation I think that we're all uh, have been bombarded with. Haiti was not necessarily denuded of trees by people that are cutting them down for firewood. When the French left Haiti, they pretty much clear cut the place. There wasn't a lot of trees left for the indigenous people that uh, remained after their, their revolution. Now, this is where we come into um, the group. Part of this phone call that my dad had talked to me about was this group called CODEP, the Cooperative, the Comprehensive Development Project. Now the Comprehensive Development Project is a sleeping giant of reforestation in Haiti. Nobody in this room has probably ever heard of them. Um, they're out of, based out of New Bern, North Carolina. The Cooperative uh, Comprehensive Development Project has been responsible for reforestation. They reforested over 30,000 acres of Haiti, one tree at a time. Last year they planted over 900,000 trees. Now this is where the introduction to the dance floor starts to come in. One, the people with CODEP have really understand, have uh, understand the Haitians and have really have a good grasp on how to dance with Haitians. They understand the Haitians, they understand their culture, they've been there for a long time. They've uh, launched a very ingenious uh, program of reforestation. The way it works is Haitians, 600 and some employees they have, are, uh, they plant trees. For every tree they plant that they get to grow up to the size of a person's forearm, they, now these villages that plant all these trees, and there are hundreds of people every day planting trees, they cooperatively come up with a decision of what they're gonna do with these points. They can trade the points for a tin a roof for a school, a cistern for their homes, or in this case, in the, I guess it was the mid 90s, <coughs> the CODEP people opted to uh, install some fish ponds. This is what Haiti looks like in the areas that CODEP has reforested. It's absolutely magnificent. This is what Haiti used to look like. Uh, this is a group of people, it's kind of interesting, just to talk about differences of culture for one quick second. Uh, this was right after a funeral. And in Haiti, when there's a funeral, everybody takes all their clothes, every piece of clothing they own, and they wash them to wash the evil spirits out. So you get a lot of influence of, of Western Africa, voodoo, and it kind of relates to the whole cause and effect complications of this dance that we're involved with. Okay, so now, David, these people have invested an awful lot of money into putting in, a lot of points into putting in these fish ponds. Now, the fish ponds idea was first presented to the Haitians under the premise that these ponds would be built, points are traded, ponds are built, food would be brought in from the United States. People like us, NGOs going down, they would bring in fish food for the fish. Well, Aristide, coup, political change, SNAP, sustainability wasn't really there. Uh, the ponds remained fallow. It was a complete, this is where it comes to an ugly term. And uh, it's a dangerous room to say this term, but there is a term in Haiti called a, uh, called a Kennedy. Now, <laughs> what a Kennedy is, is anything that appears to be good and isn't good, the Haitians call a Kennedy. <laughs> now, in defense of the Kennedys, let me just explain to you how that term came about. Uh, in the 60s, John F. Kennedy's administration sent a lot of machine oil to Haiti. Now this, not sure how this happened, whether the oil was mislabeled or what, but the Haitians assumed it was cooking oil. And uh, to this day, there's people in Haiti that weren't even alive during the Kennedy administration, and they'll see something like this and they'll say, that's a Kennedy, that's a Kennedy. So we arrived in Haiti and what we inherited was what the Haitians were calling a Kennedy, uh, a, a broken dream of false hopes. Um, actually, if I could go back one or two, okay. This picture up here in the upper left, this is my first visit to Haiti. This is pouring, making these two ponds. Actually, there's three. Um, you can see it's a lot of sweat, a lot of energy, a lot of calories, most importantly, a lot of hopes. Uh, it's 80, 90 degrees, 100% humidity, pouring 34 yards of concrete that day, all with the hopes of, man, we're gonna produce some fish, our kids aren't gonna be hungry, it's gonna be some revenue we can generate. 
These are those same ponds seven years later. You can see how it's all kind of grown up, but that is uh, what we inherited. So here was the problem. This is the first pond I visited um, after this period. These are fish that had been in this pond. These are tilapia, by the way, and I think everybody's familiar with tilapia. Tilapia are a wonderful, wonderful fish, perfect for this type of environment. Uh, they grow fast. They're super converters of plant protein into animal protein. Uh, they can take a lot of abuse, poor water quality, and they taste real good. So these fish here in this picture are probably four or five years old. Contrary to what most people think about fish, it's kind of dangerous to stay in this fish town audience here, but uh, if fish aren't fed, they don't necessarily die. They just don't grow. So these fish are probably four to five years old. Now tilapia in six months should be nice sized fish to put on your plate. This man, this is the ponds he owns. He's talking to us about this awful Kennedy he's got in his backyard. He can't even do his laundry in it. He's got mosquitoes. So we put our scientist hats on. OK, we're, this is great. We're in Woods Hole. We've got all this wonderful scientific brain power around us, probably more PhDs per square foot than any place in the world you could think of. We're going to solve this problem. This is going to be easy. This is low-hanging fruit. Let's find some valueless plants in Haiti that aren't being used for anything else, and let's do the uh, complete profile of amino acids, digestible protein, fat, kilocalories, all our scientific jargon, and let's take these plants and let's make a fish food out of it to feed the fish and then they'll feed the people. That's perfect. Port-au-Prince could blow up. We're still gonna, they're still going to be able to raise fish. It's going to be sustainable. Well. That was our first misstep in this dance. And I'm not embarrassed to say it, the misstep was due to a failure to understand our partner. Um, a lot of these people in this area where we're working spend three to five hours a day just collecting firewood or collecting water to, to cook with. They simply didn't have the time to put together this complicated food that we had put together. Second of all, a lot of Haitians can't measure. And I, there's really not a lot of need to measure. And our diet required grams of this, grams of that, grinding, you know, all this process. Um, a typical unit of measurement in Haiti is a door or a coffin lid. Um, they understand the length of a door or a coffin lid. If you want a ditch dug or something done, you say go eight doors that way. So this was our first misstep in the dance. Where are we going to go? Where am I supposed to point this thing? Here we go. OK, so thank goodness to the internet um, and some real perseverance. We located some colleagues in Israel and Bangladesh that were, that were up against the same problems, trying to raise fish using minimal resources. And they had come up with a technique called PAT, paraphyton aquaculture technique. Paraphyton is the green, slimy stuff that grows on submerged vegetation. Mother, Father, God, whoever, Mother and Father Nature has designed paraphyton to be the absolute perfect food for fish. It has got every amino acid, everything in it to make fish grow. We kibitzed with our colleagues in Israel and Bangladesh. They actually came here to Woods Hole. The technique behind paraphyton aquaculture technique involves putting substrate in a pond and putting nutrients in the pond. And if you have sunlight, nutrients, and a substrate, paraphyton will grow, and that's what the fish need to eat. So. We went back to Haiti. We introduced this technique. This is an example of paraphyte growing on a stick. Um, went back to Haiti, trained our people on how to do this. And what we found out was, my battery might be low. OK, we trained. These are all leaders, community leaders. Each one of these people is responsible for about 40 or 50 other Haitians. We trained these people with the technique. They went out and trained their brothers and sisters on the technique. We sent one of our employees, our only employee, to Haiti for six weeks. Nick Warren lived with the Haitians, kept them going. Big day, harvest. When you raise tilapia, you don't see a lot of action. Basically, you see these big pea green soup ponds. Not a lot of uh, positive reinforcement. It's like raising mold. Um, <laughs> so this is the day that we're going to harvest. This is a nerve-wracking day for all of us. We knew there were fish in these ponds. We knew the fish had grown. The Haitians had done what they were supposed to do. Let's see what happens. So a few optimistic cases. A lot of people show up with their buckets. We pull the plug on the pond. The ponds start to drain. Everybody's standing around. You hear mumbling of Kennedy and you know, these guys are in it. 
Well, lo and behold, the ponds, when they got to the bottom, we got oodles of fish. Uh, this woman here, Matamenze, put two kids through school and bought some rice with this, uh, this one harvest. Um, cell phones are incredible in Haiti. Pretty soon we found there was ponds being built way up in areas that we never even knew about, just through word of mouth. Haitians were teaching each other to dance. That was the real key to this thing. And the next phase in our project, and this is just about the end right here, we are going to start dancing with young people. This is a system, this is the first time this slide's ever been shown in public. This is a fish system we're building in a school in Jacmel, and the MBL has donated laptops. The students are going to be learning how to raise the fish, and they're going to be our new dance partners. It is hard to teach an old dog new tricks. Students want to learn, the students are going to do it, and I think that's where our future is. So, thank you.